Um, and, and there's just a little bit of feedback, so that's, that's not bad. So, all right, we're going back to chapter 24 in our textbook. Wonder what was in chapter 24 in our textbook. Well, you'll never guess where we started our conversation and where this test is going to begin. It will begin with a... about him that we wanted to highlight was why is it that between 1865 and 1900, that time period that we identified as the Gilded Age, was there this rapid economic growth? Well, central to this rapid economic growth was the growth of industry, the growth of factories, industrialization. And so what I did is I made you read Degler, right? And, and when you read Degler, you didn't like it, but you read Degler or you talked to somebody who read Degler. And in Degler, it said, why well, look, here are some reasons why the economy grew during this time. And one of the things that we said that are most people's lists of kind of factors that contributed to industrial growth during the Gilded Age was the construction of the rail network. And what we said was, between 1865 and 1900, the, the amount of railroad tracks in the United States went from about 35,000 to 200,000 miles of track. Wow, Don't that's only a limited amount, there's only a limited area. If I move from this position, let's see. Okay, uh, I'll have to stand right here, this is gonna very much inhibit me. But um, there are were, there were about 200,000 miles of track. And we, so we said that this rail network that was constructed is, is, the, is the major contributing factor to industrialization during this time. We talked a lot about that. We talked about you know, what impact the railroads had, how they created markets and allowed for, for larger markets, which allowed for larger companies, and how they allowed resources to centralize in areas for manufacturing, how they moved people into cities, how when you look at kind of the industrialization of the period, at every level, you can see that railroads are influential. And just the mere construction of the railroads themselves I mean, Carnegie built steel mills, but the steel that was, was produced largely went to building rail cars and rail lines and railroads. And so we talked about how influential the railroads were. And then we talked about the relationship between the government and railroads. And when we did that, we, we, we primarily talked about the transcontinental railroads. And we talked about the first transcontinental railroad, you know, that connected, um, you know, east to west, the, the, the um, the Central Pacific um, you know, started in Omaha and built, or excuse me, Central Pacific started in Sacramento and built east. The Union Pacific started in Omaha and built west, and they connected at Promontory Point, Utah. We said that after that, four additional railroads were constructed. You know, many of them were financed on some level by, um, oh, it's this on some level by the government with grants and loans and other things that the government issued to these railroads. And we talked a little bit about that. But you know, much of the Eastern railroads were financed by individual states, um, in some cases, or even privately. Now we also talked a lot about the railroads being enormously important. And because of their importance, um, individual states seeking to regulate them. You know, we said that, look, we never had an industry that was as important as the railroads. We never had an industry that was as large as the railroads. I mean, it was the first big business. And railroaders were the first big businessmen. And that ra the rail network was crucial not just to, to the railroads themselves, but to farmers and you know, other people. And we said, what do we do? What do we do with an industry that is so important? Can we regulate it? Can we regulate a private industry? 
And we said that, that individual states that were pushed mostly by farmers sought to regulate private industries with laws that we called the Granger Laws, right? The Granger Laws. So individual states, 14 of them, we said individual states attempted to regulate the railroads. And in fact, um, the, the, there was a, a court challenge. I mean, the railroads challenged this. Can you do this? Can, can, can individual states pass legislation that limits our ability to, to change rates or do things like that? And we said that the, the Supreme Court actually hears the case. The case is Munn versus Illinois. <coughs> And in Munn versus Illinois, we said the court ruled that, that state governments could regulate private industries that were considered to be in the public interest. And that this was an important decision. State governments could regulate private industries that seemed to be in the public interest. However, the Munn decision was overridden. It was overturned. Does anybody know by what court decision, yes. Was it Wabash? Yeah, that? the Wabash decision. And does anybody but Davis know, besides Davis, know what the Wabash decision was? I mean, oh, go ahead, this Davis, the Alec Davis. We got Davis, Davis, Alec Davis. Do you know, uh, Davis? Uh, that only federal government can regulate interstate commerce? Yes. The Wabash decision said, yes, you know, the, the, the government can regulate, or governments can regulate, um, private industry, but only the federal government can regulate industries that are involved in interstate commerce. And railroads, by their nature, were continually involved in interstate commerce. So if there was going to actually be regulation, it had to occur by the federal government. And we said the federal government does, in fact, respond to that. They pass legislation, landmark legislation. Does anybody, uh, Kelly, do you recall the name of that legislation? And then this is in response to the Wabash decision, 1887. The federal government passes legislation that's going to regulate the railroads. Do you recall, dear Kelly? It would indeed be the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, which set is an important piece of legislation because it marks the first time the federal government is going to regulate private industry. And the, and the Interstate Commerce Commission establishes, or Interstate Commerce Act establishes the Interstate Commerce Commission, whose responsibility was to make sure that rail rates were reasonable and just. Now, Emily, I know you, 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 you probably are thinking, well, oh, gee, the Interstate Commerce Commission was not very effective. The railroads manipulated it. They, they circumvented it. But it does establish a precedent. And we talked about the, the, you know, how very important the railroads were. We also talked about the emergence of big business. We said that, look, the rapid economic growth of the, of the Gilded Age, you know, it's central to it is industrialization. But the great industrial concerns of the time ended up being big companies. And we said that big business meant that there were big business men. And we talked about the growth of big business. And we talked about the great industrial leaders. And one of the things that we said was, look, how we view these people, whether we look at Andrew Carnegie as an industrial statesman, or whether we look at Andrew Carnegie as a robber baron, is, is, a, is a pertinent question. You know, what did these people do? What do they represent? We know this. We know the great industrialists of the Gilded Age built giant businesses. We know that they produced goods that, that were sold to an international market. We know that the, the industrial strength of the era was built by these men. But did they do it at the expense of exploitation, of labor, of the natural environment? Did they cheat? Did they, did they mislead? You know, are they the best of America or are they the worst of America? And we said that there were names. J.P. Morgan, who was associated with banking. We said there was Jay Gould, who was associated with railroading. Cornelius Vanderbilt, who was associated with railroading. But the two we talked about were Andrew Carnegie, who made his fortune in steel. And I don't know if you recall this, but we associated Carnegie with a particular strike in the homestead area. I don't know if you remember us talking at all about that. I think we might have mentioned it once or twice, 
about the uh, um, the homestead strike. Oh, incidentally, for that class that I just finished last night, I had to give a speech. You know, you'll never guess what I incorporated into the speech. The homestead strike. <laughs> Led with it. Led with the with, 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 with the with the with the homestead strike. So, anyways, yes, you know, Carnegie role in the homestead strike, you know, kind of highlights this. So we talked about Carnegie, who made his money in steel. We talked about Rockefeller, who made his money in oil. One thing that is going to be significant, particularly about Rockefeller, is that Rockefeller made his money in oil, but he also perfected a means of, of, um, of, uh, of, of limiting competition called the trust. You know, the trust was a way, and we talked about that. We talked about the instability of the marketplace during the Gilded Age, the recessions, the panic of 73, the panic of 93. And we said that, look, Rockefeller perfected this system of controlling competition with the Standard Oil of Ohio Trust. Now, um, how did these great men justify this? Now, if you, if you look at the organization, of your book, they kind of get take it that way. And I didn't do this in class. They said, well, all right, here's the great industrial growth of the Gilded Age. Here's why it happened, railroads, etc. Here's, you know, a little bit about railroads and their regulation. Here are some other factors that contributed to that growth. Here is the emergence of big business. Here are the big businessmen. They accumulate this massive wealth at the same time that people are impoverished and living in squalor. How do they justify that? Now, we talked about that later, but in the, in the text, it kind of organizes it that way. And one of the things that was brought up, I'll put this in my speech, too, is social Darwinism. Hannah, do you recall? You are a specialist, dear Hannah, in social Darwinism. What social Darwinism was and how that how that justified <laughs> how that justified the disparity of income and wealth that transpired during the Gilded Age, dear Hannah. Yes, I do. It's it's like if you let things go natural competitions. Maya Oliver, please report to the office. Maya Oliver to the office. What did you say, dear Hannah? If you just let things progress as like naturally, like naturally. Oh, Hannah, before we, we, we before we scrutinize that response, who was the architect of social Darwinism? The British architect? Pardon me? Not Colin Bruce. Sam, help your best friend, your ex-best friend out. Uh, William Grimes. He was the American leader of social government. The British was Spencer. Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner were both advocates of social Darwinism arguing that it was survival of the fittest amongst members of society and that the millionaire's accumulation of wealth was the result of a natural evolutionary struggle, which had to be left alone, right? So we talked about social Darwinism. We also mentioned in kind of passing Andrew Carnegie talking about something called the gospel of wealth. Um, Carnegie's gospel of wealth, we didn't talk about it in detail, but we mentioned was kind of this idea that, that look, and I, I did mention this now that I think about it, that, that, that look, you know, it's just natural. It's just natural that, that because of the nature of industrialization that there is going to be this accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few. But those few have a responsibility to the many to redistribute that wealth for the good of mankind. And so, um, you know, sort of this gospel of wealth is what Carnegie uses to justify his later philanthropy, where he gives away much of what he, what he made during, um, he said, well, incidentally, what was the name of the company that eventually merged with Carnegie Steel that was the first billion dollar company? Do you recall, Boy? Um, J.P. Morgan. No, J.P. Morgan did it, but he created yeah. U.S. Steel which is in downtown Pittsburgh as we speak today. Now, um, we said that you know, the growth of industry had a great impact, and industrialization had a great impact on workers. Oh my goodness, did we talk a lot about that, workers. And we said that industrialization changed the nature of work, right? It dehumanized 
Remember Degler's commoditization of labor, the dehumanization you know, of labor, and how labor was frustrated by how their tasks were reduced and how they didn't have a kind of a, a, a tangible part of the production process, how it was um, that they were kind of just a commodity to be bought and sold. And we connected that with the growth of the labor movement. The labor movement, when we talk about it in the Gilded Age, what we're talking about is unionization, usually on a national level. And we talked about three national unions. The National Labor Union, right, which was formed in 1866 and was a union of unions, which eventually kind of met its demise in the Panic of 73. The Knights of Labor, which started in um, 1869 and you know, grew in membership between 69 and 70, or between, you know, between 79 and 86, and eventually met its demise, really, in 1886 and was virtually gone by 1890. Now, there are a few questions on the test about the Knights of Labor, and one of which involves Bobby, who its most prominent leader was. Do you recall, dear Bobby? Powderly, yes, I was standing right in front of you when uh, we were discussing this. Were you conscious during this? <coughs> you know, you, you're always conscious. And so you must have clearly heard us talk about Terence Powderly. And Powderly is the most famous leader of the, of the Knights of Labor who had this kind of radical, um, Alex, he had this radical um, um, notion about, about the, the, the nature of unions, the future of his organization. Tell us about Powderly and his vision. Oh, it's interesting, Alex said that he didn't believe in, in, in formal strikes. He didn't think it was productive for workers to walk off the job. He would prefer arbitration and education. And what was his eventual goal? What did Powderly want to achieve? And dear Alex. Oh, no, no, no. Remember, it was beyond that graph. Grave. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, let's stop with that eight-hour day for a minute, right? Now, remember, Bobby, you can't possibly remember. You didn't remember his name, but you remember this stuff. Go ahead. That is true. Remember, Powderly wanted a gigantic organization of all workers in one big labor union for the purpose of forming these worker-producer cooperatives, where workers would have kind of say-so over the production process. They almost would kind of own their own businesses. So Powderly wanted to kind of really radically change the relationship between the worker and the business. Now, um, in terms of the basic labor goals, that was the problem. Not everyone that joined the Knights of Labor shared Powderly's kind of non-militant yet, you know, kind of radical vision. There were radicals who were militants, the anarchists and the socialists and, you know, the communists. And then there were, there were other people that were part of the Knights of Labor that just wanted things like the eight-hour day and basic labor goals. And so the problem, remember you did that cartoon where you saw all of those, you know, um, you know too many chefs in the pot, the cartoon? Well, that was the problem with the Knights of Labor. And remember, they met their demise because they were associated with the Haymarket Square Ride, yet the Knights of Labor really weren't there. The Knights of Labor didn't participate in the, the May Day strike on May 1st in Chicago. The Knights of Labor didn't sanction that, that meeting that occurred where the bomb was thrown. But because they were the largest, most identifiable labor organization in the country, they were discredited by the Haymarket Ride. Now, that organization of workers um, fades away. But the most enduring organization of workers was Watt Weissman. What organization of workers, union of unions, exists to this day, dear Weissman? The American Federation of Labor. Who was their most famous leader, Weissman? Their American Federation of Labor. Sam Adams. 
in my speech, Samuel Gompers, he was in there too, right? And, uh, Samuel Gompers was their most famous leader. And what was different? Beck, if I were to call upon you, you are a student of the uh, AFL, what was different between the Knights of Labor and the AFL, dear Beck? Go to your tutor. Tidra, would you be offended if I called it practical labor goals? They had practical labor goals, right? You know, they, they just wanted more. They wanted better working conditions, higher wages, you know, workplace safety. They did not want to take over, right? They didn't have a utopian vision for the future. Nor did they seek Reber to organize all workers. The AFL focused on mainly what type of workers? skilled workers, right? Unions of unions, right? So we talked about the AFL, we talked about, um, um, you know, the, the clashes. I don't think there, there may be a question or two about the Haymarket Square ride, but unfortunately the Homestead strike and the Pullman strike are discussed in chapter 26 in here. So I don't think there'll be any questions. It's disappointing, is it not, Matt? I don't think there'll be any questions about those great labor disputes. But that's okay, Boland. We know enough about them already. Yes, we do. Now, after talking about industrialization and economic growth, we segue to urbanization. And we said, in terms of one of the most distinctive trends of the Gilded Age was the growth of cities, urbanization. And um, we talked about the growth of cities, the rapid growth of cities. We, we, we put forth some explanations, you know, and what we said was that any time um, there was um, a kind of a major demographic shift like that, with lots of people going places, in this case to urban areas in the United States, we could explain it as a push and a pull. And what was it? What was it, Bob, that pulled people into urban areas during the Gilded Age? Um, pulled them in. Pulled, 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 pulled them in. Yes. Well, it was the excitement of the cities. Megan, we agreed with that. It was the excitement of the cities, but probably more so jobs. jobs. Economic opportunity, factory jobs, workers flooded into cities. Many of you wrote about that in your papers that you wrote, your essays about immigration and how it affected workers, and that's a good point, you know, um, that they flooded into cities. Um, and, and we said, well, look, you know, that they were looking for jobs. And what's most interesting about this flow of people into the cities is not that people left the American countryside and went to urban areas. They did. We said what was most interesting is that people flocked in from Europe. And we talked about the great migration of European immigrants, 80% of whom migrated to urban areas during the Gilded Age. Now, we divided that migration into two parts, the old migration and the new migration. What made the old migration the old migration? What made the new migration the new migration? Go ahead, uh, Taylor. Oh, that's very good, Taylor. You're very smart. The areas where they came from, the old immigrants, the older immigrants were the first phase of it. Where did they come from? They came from Northern and Western Europe. Valerie, name a country in Northern and Western Europe. Your favorite Northwestern European country. Yeah. <laughs> Take a whack at it, dear Valerie. Think of a country in the world. Ah, uh, Britain's a good one. And Britain is, is one of the Northwestern countries. Reaper, name a country. Uh, Old immigration, first phase, Scotland, England, Wales, you know, Ireland, all of those countries, Germany, first phase, old immigration. After 1880, by 1890, second phase, new immigration. Boland, how was it different? Uh, it was south and east. Southern and eastern. Name your favorite southern and eastern European country. Italy. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's our homeland. 
Italy, yes, right? Italy, that's, a, that, you know, uh, lots of Italian immigrants, Greek immigrants, Russian immigrants, Polish immigrants. How were those immigrants different from the first uh, uh, wave of immigrants that came in? We said they were distinctive. This second wave of immigrants were distinctive. Go ahead, Jeannie, how were they different? Oh, they were less likely to assimilate. They tended to be poor. Religiously, that second wave, what were their religions? Go ahead, Matt. They were Catholics. They were, Catholics. They were Orthodox and a large number of Jews. You know, Eastern European Jews came in huge numbers. The Lower East Side of Manhattan, you know, with that enormous density population of Eastern European Jews that flocked into the United States. Now remember, the Eastern European Jews that came, they were pulled, but they were also pushed. It was discrimination and persecution in Europe that pushed those people off of their lands. And they came in large numbers to work in the garment industries in New York City, Lower East Side of Manhattan, extremely densely populated. You know, the push and the pull. Many of the other Europeans went back. What was a bird of passage? Well, I'll tell you what a bird of passage is. That's somebody that came and then made money and returned. You know, in some cases, a fourth of all immigrants did that. And we even saw that on the manifests of the, of the ships that we saw, that there were even American citizens that went back to Europe and then they came back and, you know, they aspired to buy land there. And we talked at, at great lengths about these immigrants that came in and we said that, look, many of them were greeted with hostility, right? You know, a nativism is the idea of America for Americans. And remember, we also said that they were considered to be racially distinct. You know, that the southern and northern Europeans were considered, or southern and northern Italians were considered to be of different racial distinctions, which is fascinating. And we said that these people just flocked to urban areas, to these ethnic enclaves, and major cities, and that although they seemed romantic, they were terrible. That the slums and the ghettos of these major cities were terrible. Oh, what was the name of that book that was written? And who was the author of that book that we said chronicled the terrible conditions? Brianna, do you remember the name of that book that was written and the name of the author of that book that you do not? Nicole, do you re recall the name of the son of a guy? Sabu, do you re uh, uh, Don't make me call it Anna Gray because I'll do it. Go ahead, Anna. How the Other Half Lives. How the Other Half Lives, and that was Jacob Reese, R-I-I-S that wrote that book and showed those pictures of how terrible the conditions were in New York City. And we said, because of social Darwinism, because of the Protestant work ethic, because of, you know, you know ideas of American individuality, you know, um, and uh, responsibility, that most people blamed the immigrants themselves because of ideas of racial superiority for their problems. And we said that as long as they did that, big city political bosses were able to, to base their power on the poverty of the immigrant masses that flooded into those cities. And we talked about how city governments were, were um, 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 you know, uh, controlled by big city political bosses. Oh, Bob, what was the name of that one boss that we mentioned? You know, we mentioned one political boss in particular. Do you recall? Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed in New York City. And, you know, we talk a lot about how the bosses maintain their power, how they would, um, um, you know, how they would, um, um, you know, have uh, kickbacks and, you know, how they would award contracts and how, but, but even though they did these terribly corrupt things, we said that they did take care of the people. They did meet the basic needs of the people. And that most other people, reformers, were unwilling to do that. We said that there were people that wanted to address the problems of the cities, but they wanted to address them from the vantage point of it being the fault of the people who were there. These were people that wanted to limit immigration, you know, anti-immigration leagues and other things like this. These are people that wanted to promote temperance. But there were a few people that, that recognized that it might not have been the fault of the poor. It might not have been the fault of the impoverished. And we said two movements that sought to kind of deal with the problems of the city was the social gospel, which was a religious movement, and the settlement house movement. Oh, darn it. 
Oh, darn it. Darn it, darn it, Bobby. What person do we associate with the Settlement House movement? Two Ds had it on the board yesterday. Come back in. Jane Adams, right? Does anybody remember the name of her Settlement House? Hall House, H-U-L-L, -L, Jane Adams Hall House recognizes that the poverty of the city urban dweller, the slums were a result of circumstances, not because the, the people that went there were racially inferior or intellectually inferior or inferior, lazy, drunken, um, in, in some other way, but because of circumstances. Also, the advocates of the social gospel, Walter Rushenbush and Washington Gladden, argued that, look, Christians had an obligation to help to deal with the problems of poverty in urban areas. Now, we did say that during the Gilded Age, most people were content to allow kind of the problems of the cities to continue, and that's why the political bosses were able to maintain power. Now, we concluded our conversation about industrialization and urbanization by talking about some of the intellectual trends of the time period. And what we said was this. We said, look, that Darwinism affects most things. And when we say Darwinism, what we're talking about is evolution. And evolution suggests that there is this natural competitive struggle, and the result is progress, right? I mean, you know, if you believe in evolution, you believe that from, from nothing came man, or not nothing, from disorganized matter, I guess, came man in this evolutionary struggle. Well, okay, if you apply that notion to other things, you say, well, if things are left alone and, and there is this competition amongst species, whether it's socially, you know, or whether it's in other areas, then what you'll get is progress. But you've got to leave it alone and let the winners win and the losers lose. And we said that that notion permeated lots of different things. But there were important dissenters to Darwinism. And one of those dissenters was William James that, that promoted the philosophy of pragmatism. What did, a, a, pra, like, what did the pragmatist argue? You do. Son of a gun, Belay. What if I would, yes, go ahead. What's true is what works. We also talked about Henry George and Edward Bellamy. What was Henry George's book? Does anyone besides Emily Stevens and myself remember the name of Henry George's book? Go ahead, Emily. Poverty and Progress. Po Poverty and Progress. And George talked about the single tax and the idea of land ownership being inherently unfair. And Edward Bellamy's book was, Taylor, what do you recall? Uh, looking Backwards. Looking Backwards. There, looking Backwards talks about this, this utopian vision in the future. There are a few questions on the test about educational institutions, about colleges, something called the Morrell Land Grant Act that um, uh, promoted the construction of, of universities, Penn State, almost heaven, where everyone wants to be, Penn State University, um, Happy Valley is a land grant um, uh, uh, college, right? So we talked about some random topics at the end of chapter 25 in the book. Then we got into chapter 27, and son of a gun, was that interesting? Because what we were talking about is kind of what some people think is the natural extension of industrialization. If, 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 you, if you have the growth of industry right, in your country, and you build up your, 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 your capital, and you build up your factories and your infrastructure, and you produce, Sometimes you end up overproducing, right? And if there are periods of overproduction, this results in declines in the economy and panics. And so, you know, um, we, we, we kind of suggested that, maybe not directly, that industrialization does connect to imperialism, expansionism. And a lot of people are going to argue that. I mean, Marx in the Communist Manifesto is going to say, hey, look, the natural extension of, of, of capitalism is imperialism. The capitalists will seek to spread their influence. So we, said, we didn't necessarily make this connection. But we said in the 1890s 
the United States experienced kind of a shift in disposition toward the world. That during, you know, the, the, between 1865 and 1890, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, Americans were kind of indifferent to what was happening in the world. They were disinterested. You know, they were focused on internal development. But by 1890, this kind of changed. Oh, and we put a remarkable chart on the board. I mean, I don't know if you recall it, but when I think back, I think back fondly. Because I remember right in the middle of our chalkboard, we had expansionism. And then we had economic motives for expansionism. And then we had cultural motives for expansionism. And then we had religious motives for expansionism. And then we had military motives for expansionism. And if you remember, just for fun, just for fun, yesterday or Tuesday when we were talking about the eventual annexation of the Philippines, we could have drawn from each one of those areas as an explanation as to why the United States finally acquired the colony of the Philippines, right? Why that happened. But anyways, we were talking about those things and we were associating ideas the idea that, that ex American expansionism was connected to a desire for markets, you know, to find places, you know, to sell our products. Hence the open door in China in the aftermath of the Spanish War. We talked about, you know, these cultural ideas like social Darwinism and how social Darwinism connected to expansionism. We talked about manifest destiny. We talked about uh, the Turner thesis. What, what, it, what in fact was the Turner thesis? Does anyone recall anyone besides um, Alice and Perry and myself? Go ahead, Yankee. I think that the frontier made us who we are. Oh, yes. The, the, the Frederick Jackson Turner. Oh, did we not have a three name theme through all of this? <laughs> right? We had a three name theme. Frederick Jackson Turner argued that what made America was conquering the frontier. And he was concerned that the frontier was closing. You know, it was actually closed, and so we had to expand into other frontiers. But what maybe one of the biggest kind of contributors to this expansionistic notion was three names, Alfred Thayer Mahan, right? Um, what did Alfred Thayer Mahan do? We talked about him. Do you recall? Um, yes, go ahead, Jimmy. He, he wrote The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, which advocated Davis for what? Matt Davis for what? Uh, big Navy. Very good. A large navy, right? A large navy. And with a large navy, you would need colonies and coaling stations. You can see, again, Mahan's influence. Look, at the, at the end of the Spanish-American War, what do we have? A big navy and colonies and influence, right? So that chart, I, I can't keep, I, I stop thinking, I, I can't stop thinking about that chart we had on the board, how that all comes to fruition, how fortunate you kids were to be able to see that chart. Now, we said that this whole expansionistic sentiment that emerges during this time from all these different sources that we identified um, comes to full fruition in the uh, Spanish-American War. But there are a number of other incidents that almost result in conflicts that we just briefly mentioned. One I want to draw your attention to that I want you to look at tonight in Chapter 27 in your textbook is the Venezuelan border dispute. The Venezuelan border dispute. And I also want you to look at um, the annexation of Hawaii. Those were two things that occurred. Oh, incidentally, when did the annexation of Hawaii occur? I mean, we know that that happened. Belay, you did not know the answer to the last question. Is there any chance you might know the answer to this? I'll call on Allison Berry if you force me to. Call on Allison. Son of a gun. Just. It was annexed actually during the um, Spanish War, but it wasn't a part of that. You know, it wasn't a part of the, you know, the, the war itself, but it was annexed during the war. But read about that also. Now, in terms of the Spanish War, you know, we said, look, you know, we, we made the connection between um, the Cuban insurrection and the, 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 the America's in, entrance into the world of the Spanish War. And I mean, that was it. I mean, remember I said on a couple of occasions, if you could only say one thing to explain why the United States went to war with Spain, it would be Cuba. 
and that the Cubans in 1895 sought their independence from Spain, and that a three-year guerrilla war was fought, and increasingly Americans came to believe that we needed to intervene in that war for a variety of reasons, one of which was yellow journalism. Oh, darn it. What is this yellow journalism? Um, yellow journalism, go ahead. Uh, so it's newspaper reporting, right? And what two names, uh, Lillian, are, are, are now arrival? Were you knocking on the door earlier? Uh, there, I heard somebody knocking on the door. That was not you. Um, who were the two publishers that we associated with yellow journalism, do you recall? Hertz and Pulitzer, who had these big newspapers competing for circulation by telling <coughs> stories, or sometimes embellished stories about, you know, um, um, things that were happening in this Cuban insurrection. Now, this Cuban insurrection is a war between the Cuban people and Spain over Cuba's independence. Do we have any real business in that? No. Right? We're not involved in that. We eventually decide to become involved because we think that it is for the sake of humanity that we do so. Right? McKinley is going to capitulate to a sentiment to enter in that war. And maybe one of the biggest things um, or reasons why he's kind of forced to do this is the sinking of the Maine. Remember, the Maine was down in Havana Harbor as to, to kind of protect U.S. interests there, and it was an accidentally sunk, we know now, but the American people chose to blame Spain for that. So it's, remember, the Maine sinks February 15th, April 11th of that same year, McKinley asks for authorization to use force in Cuba, which prompts the Spanish to declare war against us. But, give me a chance here. But we are sure that we are not taking Cuba as a colony because we actually passed legislation that says that we won't do it. <laughs> There you go. There you go. He's on the swimming team too, is he not? Well, he, so I thought it was all swimmers for a mo moment there. But, but O'Donnell's on it, and he knows it was the Teller Amendment, which Alex was self-denying. We will not take Cuba. Oh, we, we passed the Teller Amendment that says we won't take Cuba. But when Cuba is independent, we just mentioned this today, another amendment defines our relationship with the Cubans. Do you recall? Do you recall? What? The Platt Amendment, right? They're different. The Platt Amendment, obviously, they're different, right? Um, now, in terms of the war in, in Cuba itself, the U.S. Army performs very, you know, lacklusterly. I mean, it's poorly organized. We do defeat the Spanish, which is kind of this, I don't want to say mystery, but, you know, it might have been because they were worse off and less enthusiastic. Large numbers of people die as a result of disease and to some extent mismanagement. But we are successful in the Spanish War. And the question then becomes, after a 113-day war, what does the United States do with the possessions that they acquire as a result of the war? And remember, we said the things that, the, the territories that we took and occupied were Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Cuba. Cuba was going to be independent, tell our amendment. Guam, Puerto Rico is a part of the United States today for Anchor Act. The question became the Philippines, which we talked about at length on Tuesday, this great discussion about whether or not to annex the Philippines, which, you know, McKinley is going to kind of decide to do you know, despite his own misgivings and the criticism of many in Americans that think that this is a gigantic mistake, that is inconsistent with our ancient traditions. And, you know, at the end of the day, it almost like, it's almost like McKinley says, what do you want me to do? You know, what are our alternatives? Remember when he says, well, we can't do this, and we can't do this, and we can't do this, and we can't do this, so we're going to have to take them. Christianize them, civilize them, and put them on the road to independence, which eventually does occur. We talked about some of the anti-imperialist um, um, anti arguments, you know, from the different people. Oh, wasn't that a 
Remember we put the different people on the board, Jane Adams and William Graham Sumner, Gompers and Andrew Carnegie, Cleveland and William Jennings Bryan. Remember we put that on the board and then we said, what does that tell you and no one knew? Remember that? Let me put it on the board. But eventually I said, well, look, might it tell you that they, they, they oppose um, um, the acquisition of colonies for different reasons? And then we discussed some of those reasons, practical reasons, ideological reasons. There might be questions on the test about that, certainly. There are also going to be questions about the Filipino response to that. The Filipinos don't like it that we are going to annex their territory. And they, they respond by a Filipino insurrection of its own. Amelia Guinaldo is a great Filipino leader of that insurrection, who's mentioned in your textbook, right, as, as being the leader of that, who eventually is captured, kind of like trick him. Guinaldo, you know, we, we, we tell Guinaldo, okay, we want to get together and talk about, uh, you know, you know this, this thing, and then we just capture it. You know, so um, Guinaldo is, a, is an initial leader of that, and you can read a little bit about that. Now, after we annexed the Philippines, we went on to talk about the open door in China, and that was our conversation of today. We said that the open door of China basically meant free trade in China. What we wanted in China was free trade and to protect the territorial integrity of China. An, in, not an independent, self-sustaining China in which all nations were allowed to freely trade. That was threatened a little bit by the Boxer Rebellion, which we mentioned today, which was that nationalistic backlash against all the foreign influence in China. Um, and we talked a little bit also today about the election of Theodore Roosevelt, the reasons why he was on the, the ballot, and the construction of the Panama Canal, which is also asked about your, uh, on your test. What country, incidentally, was Panama a part of prior to its independence? Colombia. Colombia. And Colombia got nothing out of the eventual, but an apology eventually, out of the eventual um, <laughs> circumstance with the Panama Canal. And one last question. What was the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine? The Roosevelt, good, that uh, can That's a good way of putting it. Only the United States could, the only way I change is intervene. Intervene in Latin America. That if European powers had a problem with Latin American countries, they should see us. All right, that will do it. You can find this if you want to watch it again on the YouTube, the Gateway 3.0.